Hi, welcome to Evidence for Faith. So glad you're joining me again today for a lesson in biblical archaeology as we're looking at evidence to support the book of Daniel. What has been found in the book of Daniel uh, that uh, we find in our Bibles that we have archaeological evidence supporting? Because the Bible, I do believe, is the inspired word of God. I don't believe it was a man-made thing. I believe God gave these writers um, through the Holy Spirit's inspiration to write things down. And God doesn't make mistakes because God is true. So I believe that the Bible is real. And there's archaeology, that, as we've been seeing in, in many series that we've been doing, that back a lot of this up. So we're going to be seeing today a very interesting and very, very famous discovery that was made. Um, and it, this one is the Cyrus Cylinder. And I have a, a replica of the Cyrus Cylinder here on, on the table in front of me. And you can see the size of this thing as I pick this um, up and I show it. It's literally a cylinder. As you can see, parts of it have been broken off and stuff throughout time, but it is a cylinder. The way this would be read, because um, this would be like a library book. If you were to go to the library in a ancient uh, a Babylon or something like that, and you'd pick these things up, it's the uh, Chaldean language written here. But the thing is, they would roll this onto clay like so, and it would give you the imprint, and that's what you would then read. You didn't try and read it off these things. You would roll it onto clay and be able to pick up then and see what it is. And you can see it be, It can be used over and over and over. And this has been damaged. It's and You'll see a little in a, uh, a few moments here of how this was put together, how this was discovered. But it's a remarkable discovery. This is a museum copy. Obviously, the real one is in a museum. This is a museum copy, um, but it's, it's very accurate in the way that it's written. It's got the same language and everything all on here. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So it's called the Cyrus Cylinder. You can download information on this. You can go to Biblical Archaeology Review um, and other magazines and stuff like this and read about this yourself. But um, let me just sort of point out a little bit about its discovery and then what's on here, what do we see in the Bible, and I'm going to give you another little clue about how accurate the Bible is because we're going to take the first century um, Jewish historian Josephus, because he talks a lot about the same stuff that's actually on this cylinder and is actually in our Bible itself, um, to show you that this this thing is real. So, are you ready? You're ready to join on today and go through a little lesson here? Well, I hope so. So, let's begin. Going back into 1879, in March of 1879, there was a dig being done by the British Museum. Um, and an archaeologist named um, Hormuz Rassam was supervising this dig at the ancient city of Babylon. And at, he was at the foot of the remains of the temple of uh, Ezaglia. And while he was digging at the foot of this, he discovered a hoard of broken clay tablets and, and fragments of broken clay uh, tablets and stuff and a clay cylinder that was broken up. So they glued the cylinder back together. And that's basically what we have here with this, this thing here. This is a copy of what was broken and then glued back together. You can see the fissure marks actually still in the museum copy of this. Parts of it are missing. As you can see, even certain words and sections of words are missing in different parts of this. And if you look at the back, a whole section is still missing. But what is contained in this thing is absolutely astounding and amazing on this Cyrus cylinder. Well, they glued it back together. And he, as he was working, as I said, for the British Museum, the person in charge of the dig was Sir Henry Rawlinson. And he was working for the museum also. And he studied the cylinder when they put this back together with glue. And he named it actually the Cyrus Cylinder in a publication that he made in November of the same year, 1879, that he did this thing. Now, what does this cylinder contain? This cylinder contains information about the reign of Cyrus the Great, the, the king of Persia, and how it's described in here and how the removing of King Nabonidus of the Chaldeans 
that that took place because he conquers uh, Babylon. And this is talked about in the cylinder, how he removes King Nabonidus of the, Chal of the Chaldeans in Babylon and stuff like this by the will of the god Marduk. Now, Marduk was the chief god of Mesopotamia. And it also says on the cylinder he, that uh, Cyrus did this with the approval, of course, of Marduk who Cyrus worshipped, and also other gods that were in, contained in this, um, the gods uh, Bel and Nabu. Nabu. And those idols, gods, um, that Cyrus uh, worshipped, he says, helped him in overcoming and defeating Nabonidus. So the reason this happened, why would the gods favor him over Nabonidus? Why Cyrus over Nabonidus? Nabonidus um, made, according to historians and stuff, and what we read in cylinders and clay tablets and things, Nabonidus, who was king of Babylon, made the god Marduk very angry um, during his reign. And so angry, because actually in the city of Babylon, he sort of outlawed the worship of that god Marduk, which was one of the chief gods. And um, because of this, the people in Babylon got upset with him and kicked him out of the city. He was still the king. He left his son Belshazzar in charge, but he went off to a different city and reigned then um, in a different city, which he wasn't there when Cyrus conquers Babylon. But he was still the king, the overall king of Babylon, but he left his son as the regent king in Babylon, which we'll come to in another lesson when we talk about Belshazzar's cylinder. But anyway, this is all confirmed also in the book of Daniel, chapter 5, is when this event is taking place, which is described here on this Cyrus cylinder. How Nabonidus had left his son Belshazzar in charge as co-regent of the kingdom. It, it, we can read in Daniel chapter 5, verse 30, it says that very night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. Cyrus had this guy killed in Babylon. Daniel even records this event. You might recall this event as being the, the story about the handwriting on the wall and stuff. That was that banquet going on. This cylinder that you see here contains writing on this on this cylinder, writing about that account of that evening, how Babylon was conquered in 539 BC, and that it was Cyrus who was the commander, who, who was the king, who conquered it. And what is fascinating is, because the Bible even talks about this, he did it without a battle. He did it without a battle. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the English translation on part of what you see here with the cylinder, what the cylinder actually contains in English. And so now there's a couple of places where some of the words are missing because as I showed you, it's it was damaged. But as we put it, the thing, they put this thing back together. This is what it reads. I am Cyrus. When I, well disposed, entered Babylon, I set up the seat of dominion in the royal palace amidst jubilation. And rejoicing, Marduk, the great god, caused the big-hearted inhabitants of Babylon to something probably like welcome me. My numerous troops moved about undisturbed in the midst of Babylon. I did not allow any to terrorize. So right there, we're seeing a description of the fall of Babylon, which takes place in Daniel chapter 5. Um, Daniel and the, the great feast going on with Belshazzar. That's what's taking place. So Daniel writes about this great celebration. It talks about a celebration here. Jubilation was taking place. Daniel 2 mentions the exact same thing was taking place the night Babylon fell and that Cyrus enters into the city. And there's no talk in the book of Daniel chapter 5 about a big battle going on. It does say that Belshazzar was killed that night. That is true. But um, not, other agree, not everybody agrees with all of the information on this cylinder. But the thing is, it does state that what we just saw. The Bible states that Cyrus came in. It was not a battle and that Belshazzar was killed. And uh, Daniel uh, records this and the Cyrus cylinder has the same thing. Now, normally, many officials and citizens are usually killed when you take over a city. And when con uh, any type of conqueror comes into the city, they often kill the officials uh, besides the king or governor or whatever, and they kill uh, many citizens. There's usually a large siege in the battle. Yet, Daniel tells us that's not how it took place. It seems like in Daniel, the guy just walks into the city. That's the way it's phrased. Cyrus just entered the city. 
and Babylon seemed to fall just like that. Well, this cylinder supports exactly what by, uh, ba Daniel is saying here, how Babylon fill, uh, fell because there was no major siege. There was a celebration going on. The cylinder also contains information stating that this was with the will of the gods of um, like Marduk and others. And the gods approved Cyrus for doing this because of the bad things that Nabonidus had done that angered the gods. Thus, the people were rejoicing that the city was, was now um, going to be in the hands of Cyrus and the gods would now be appeased and they'd be happy. This cylinder also contains information that Cyrus established peace in the land that is actually recorded on the cylinder. It records how he sought to improve the lives of all of the people that the Chaldeans had captured, deported, and oppressed, and now allowed the people to worship the gods of their choice, which Nabonidus did not allow them to do. Nabonidus had ordered the people to worship his favorite gods and not Marduk. This, according to historians, infuriated the priests of Marduk in Babylon, and not just that, but many of its citizens. So the people were unhappy, so unhappy that Nabonidus had to leave the city and leaving Belshazzar as the co-regent, his son, as the, the, the king there. Uh, this cylinder records that when Cyrus entered the city, he presented himself to the priests. This is actually recorded on the cylinder, that he actually re um, comes in and he presents himself to the priests and the people, as he, it's, it's being described here, as a liberator that he is liberating the people and also acting as a, uh, a benefactor of the gods that Nabonidus has insulted. So that's what we see on this cylinder and certain parts of it. Now, this cylinder also contains information on how Cyrus allowed the foreign people, like the Babylonians and stuff, that um, he had, um, the Babylonians had deported and had been oppressing and stuff, the cylinder actually states that Cyrus allows the people to go back to their own countries and to rebuild the temples of their gods in their other countries, to restore their form of worship in all these different countries that Nebuchadnezzar had conquered. He commanded on this cylinder, he actually commanded the people, the different nations, to go back to their, their homelands, rebuild their temples for their gods. Because according to this, Cyrus deemed that these gods actually allowed him to conquer Babylon and to do this. So he wanted to honor the gods. Now, this cylinder is not the actual royal proclamation. Some people think that. It does, it's not the royal proclamation but it is a historical summation of what Cyrus did. This has a lot of different things on the cylinder that was written here, and a lot of it has to do with things that Cyrus did, important things that he did in his reign, and that is one of them. And we can see how this aligns directly with the biblical accounts as well. Now, the Jews on the Cyrus cylinder are not specifically mentioned. They're not named on here as the Jews, but there is, um, a royal proclamation on this cylinder that was decreed by Cyrus, giving them, and like I say, the other nations, to the West to return to their home and to rebuild their temple. Now, the thing is, this is also recorded in the Bible. If you go to the book of Ezra, chapter 1, the first seven verses, it reads this. And this is, again, out of the English Standard Version. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by mouth uh, of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. 
He is God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the heads of the fathers of the houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites and everyone whose spirit God had stirred up to go to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided, aided them with sil vessels of silver, gold, with goods, with beasts, with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. Cyrus, the king, also brought out, get this now, brought out the vessels of the house of the Lord that Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and placed in the house of his gods. Now, what we're just read, what we have just read here in Ezra is being fulfilled in history, but it's also been recorded on the Cyrus cylinder. That we see this is actually taking place historically. But there's, but there's more to be seen here. I want you to recall that Daniel wrote that the gold and the silver utensils of the temple had been removed by Nebuchadnezzar, of course, but brought to Babylon. Then in chapter 5, at this, in chapter 5, you have the feast going on with the handwriting on the wall and stuff. But Daniel mentions that they brought those gold and um, artifacts and stuff from Solomon's temple, that they brought them into the main hall for this celebration, celebrating to the gods of Babylon. I mean, what an insult to God. Cyrus, in his decree, commands that these holy vessels be returned to the new temple being rebuilt in Jerusalem. Ezra also records this. In Ezra chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, we read, However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, Cyrus the king made a decree that his this house of God should be rebuilt. Okay, temples can be rebuilt. He continues, and the gold and the silver vessels of the house of God, stop here. Remember, that's what we read in Daniel chapter 5, continuing, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple that was in Jerusalem and brought into the temple of Babylon. These Cyrus the king took out of the temples of Babylon, and they were delivered to one whose name was uh, Sheshazbar, whom he made governor. And he said to him, take these vessels and go put them in the temple that is in Jerusalem and let the house of God be rebuilt on this site. You see, the Bible also records, as this cylinder does, as this, this actual cylinder records, that Cyrus felt compelled by the gods to rebuild temples, and one of which was the temple of God in Jerusalem. And we can read about that also, again, found in the Bible, in the book of 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles chapter, 20, uh, chapter 36, verses 22 through 23, we read, Now, in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing. Get that. Put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. So we see this taking place. And we know that about 50,000 Jews responded to the proclamation. Remember, the proclamation is not on this. This is a summation of what Cyrus says, but it is talked about on this, that these people were allowed to go back. And this royal proclamation that Cyrus made, that they would be allowed to return to Judah under the leadership, as the Bible tells us, of Zerubbabel, who would act as their leader. Now, another fascinating biblical fact about this. And this this is where it really starts to get good. I mean, really interesting. This was all talked about over 200 years before it all happened by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah writes about this. Amazingly, Isaiah wrote a prophecy on how the Jews, get this now, think about this, how the Jews would return 
to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the destroyed temple of God. Now, why is this fascinating? Why am I making a point of this? When Isaiah wrote this, Jerusalem was standing. The temple was standing. You see, at the time of Isaiah, the Jews were under the impression that Solomon's temple was eternal. It would never be destroyed. Jerusalem would never be destroyed. Yet Isaiah specifically saying the temple will be destroyed, Jerusalem will be destroyed, but they will be rebuilt. Now, that's an amazing prophecy right there, that the Jews would then be deported, and that Isaiah is saying they will be allowed to come back, rebuild Jerusalem, the city, and rebuild the temple. And we can see this. And there's something else that's just absolutely amazing about this. Isaiah tells us 200 years before it even happens, who is going to do it. He actually names the king who will allow this. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, we read, Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, she shall be rebuilt. Whoa. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Did you catch that? Isaiah is speaking about Cyrus. And it goes on. You go to chapter 45 of Isaiah, look at verse 13. It reads, I have stirred him up in righteousness, and I will make all his way level. He shall build my city and set my exiles free. Not for the price of reward, says the Lord of hosts. Who's he talking about? Isaiah names him. It's Cyrus. These are statements about Cyrus. Cyrus isn't even born yet. He doesn't even exist when this prophecy is made. And most scholars believe that Isaiah wrote this around, probably somewhere around 742 BC. Yet it didn't come true until 539 BC. I mean, only God makes predictions like this, and they always come out 100% accurate. Matter of fact, there's a test that if somebody says they're a prophet of God and they make some prediction, it doesn't come true. That's a false prophet. Take him out and stone him. I mean, there's a lot of people be being stoned today by all the predictions they make on things. But if God says something and tells people to do it, it's going to come true exactly as it says. And he is so perfect on this because he even names, almost 200 years ahead of time, he names the king who's going to do it. How cool is this? Now, some may say, that God did make an error here because he's talking about the walls in the city were going to be rebuilt by, uh, not by Zerubbabel, because we know from the Bible, Nehemiah rebuilds the walls of the city. Now, it is true that the walls were rebuilt by Nehemiah during the reign of Artaxerxes I, and that happens in 446 BC. But when Nehemiah came to Jerusalem to rebuild it, as it's talking about here, the buildings of the city were already there. People were living there again. It's just that the walls weren't rebuilt yet. So it is true, God does tell Nehemiah, you're going to rebuild the walls, but the city had already been started to be rebuilt ahead of time, which is what Cyrus decreed. There was no mention about rebuilding the walls, but the city would be rebuilt. Nehemiah comes along later and then builds the walls. There, there's, we can obtain another clue about this Cyrus, um, how he came to support the Jews in rebuilding the city and the temple. Here, we got to go to the ancient historian Josephus, and he records in his Antiquities of the Jews the following story. Now, I want, after hearing all of this, what we see in this cylinder, what we've read in the Word of God, now we're going to go to a historian who's writing this for the Romans, uh, giving them the history of this whole thing, and in the Antiquities of the Jews, one of the books that Josephus writes, and it's uh, Antiquities of the Jew, chapter or book i'm sorry book number 11 and the first three sections i'm going to read this for you from um this book and because i have a beautiful copy here of the works of josephus and i'm going to read you this section here um book number 11 uh the first three sections now listen carefully to what you see here and what we read in the bible and what we have read off the cylinder and see how interesting this is in the first year of the reign of Cyrus, which was the 70th from the day that our people were removed out of their own land in Babylon, God commiserated 
the captivity and the calamity of these poor people, according as he had foretold them by Jeremiah the prophet before the destruction of the city, that after they had served Nebuchadnezzar and his prosperity, and after they had undergone that servitude 70 years, he would restore them again to the land of their fathers, and they should build their temple and enjoy their ancient prosperity. And these things God did afford them, for he stirred up the mind of Cyrus and made him write this throughout all Asia. Quote, Thus says Cyrus, the king, since God Almighty has appointed me to be the king of the inhabitable earth, I believe that he is that God which the nation of the Israelites worship, for indeed he foretold my, by my name, by the prophets, that I should build him a house in Jerusalem in the country of Judea. Unquote. Continuing with Josephus now in the second section. This was known to Cyrus by his reading of the book which Isaiah had left behind him of his prophecies. For this prophet said that God had spoke thus to him in a secret vision, saying, My will is that Cyrus, whom I have appointed to be the king over many great nations, send back my people to their own land and build my temple. This was foretold by Isaiah. 140 years before the temple was demolished. Accordingly, when Cyrus read this, he admired the divine power and the earnest desire and ambition seized upon him to fulfill what was so written. So he called for the most eminent Jews that were in Babylon and said to him, to them, and gave them leave to go back to their own country and to rebuild their city, Jerusalem and the temple of God, for that he would be their assistant, and that he would write to the rulers and the governors that were in the neighborhood of their country of Judea, that they should contribute to them gold and silver for the buildings of the temple, and besides that, the beasts for their sacrifices. When Cyrus had said this to the Israelites, the rulers of the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, with the Levites and the priests, went in haste to Jerusalem. And many of them stayed at Babylon, not willing to leave their possessions. And when they were come thither, all the king's friends assisted them and brought in, for the building of the temple, some gold, some silver, and some great cattle and horses. So they performed their vows to God and offered the sacrifices that had been accustomed of old time. I mean, this upon the rebuilding of their city and the revival of the ancient practices relating to their worship. Cyrus also sent back to them the vessels of gold of God, which King Nebuchadnezzar had pillaged out of the temple and had carried to Babylon. Wow. Now, Daniel, in his book, records that he had access to the book of Jeremiah. If you read the book of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel did Bible studies too. He read the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah foretold this event and stuff like this was going to happen too. So Jeremiah, Daniel reads this. Thus, if Daniel has a copy there in Babylon of Jeremiah, it's very likely that Cyrus also had access to that book, Jeremiah, and most likely to the book of Isaiah, since his name actually appears in it. And as we see from Josephus in the historical accounts, the priest actually took this to Cyrus to let him read possibly himself what was here concerning his name written over 100 and almost 200 years prior. So Cyrus probably had access to these books as well. It is most likely that when these historic events all took place, the Jewish priest gave these texts to Cyrus to make sure he sees this. Thus, the Cyrus Cylinder is an amazing archaeological discovery that sheds light on a couple of key biblical events and does so with absolute tremendous accuracy. This is an amazing find that, again, supports what the Bible states. Both we see it from Ezra, we see from the book of Isaiah, the book of Daniel, and even Jeremiah. All of these things fit in. Folks, this is amazing because this book is true. You can trust in it. 
The historical evidence supports this. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson with us as we've looked at the Cyrus Cylinder. As we continue this series and, and coming into the, uh, we've been doing this series on Daniel, and I hope you've enjoyed this. We'd love to hear comments um, and and any questions, and we'd love for you to pray for us also as we continue in this ministry, Evidence for Faith. So until we meet again, please take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.